conducting doctoral research on the legitimization of artificial intelligence in Africa. Uh, Jake is also a Queen Elizabeth advanced scholar with the Open Africa Innovation Research. Uh, and he's a partner at Praxis and Gnosis Law in Nigeria. Jake founded Law to Go in 2008, a digital library of human rights law and legal services for Nigeria. And he has been a human rights lawyer in Nigeria since 2011. Uh, Jake is also uh, a climate leader and a mentor trained by former US President Al Gore. He's also a global shaper for the Abuja Nigeria Hub. And uh, he serves as uh, equity and inclusion steering uh, committee of the global uh, shapers community. Uh, Jake is also a World Economic Forum expert on human rights and is currently on the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Frontier Risks. Jake has held fellowships at Harvard Law School, at Harvard Kennedy School, at the Mandela School of Governance in South Africa, and the Pan-African Lawyers Union in Tanzania. Jake has also served as the International Law Scholar with the Center for International Governance Innovation in Canada. Uh, he is a distinguished Humphrey Herbert Humphrey alum with the US State Department and the Distinguished Dutch Visitors alum in Netherlands. Uh, Jake has delivered lectures at the University of Abuja in Nigeria, uh, the Ontario Tech University in Canada, the University of Oxford in the UK and York University. Uh, Jake holds two master's degrees in law from the University of Oxford and the Osgood Hall Law School respectively. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Jake Okechuku Efodu. Thank you very much, Kelvin. And thanks, Evan. Thanks for inviting me to what's happening with the IRC. Thanks for you know, reading out all, the, all my achievements. <laughs> I'm really humbled by that. I'm also very inspired. I'm, I mean, thank you so much for inviting me and I look forward to a really great conversation. Jake, would you mind sharing your uh, okay proceed? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. Okay, so welcome everyone to what's happening in Nigeria. Um, for the next twenty minutes, I will just take you through quite briefly. Um, Tell you a bit about Nigeria. I'll start with that, and then I would also tell you a bit about what's going on in the country. So. Nigeria is quite popular because it's the most populous country in Africa, over 221 million people. It's right there in that red dot in the western part of, uh, of Africa. We have a GDP of over 440 billion and oil and gas accounts for 80% of our national revenue. Nigeria prides itself with its ethnic diversity, language diversity and more. The country has a profile that is very unique and interesting in terms of the climate. We range from tropical rainforest up to arid steep region. You can see that diversity with the map. Um, the northern part seems to be hotter than um, and the southern part. In terms of religious profile, Nigeria is quite divided between Christian and Muslim in this I mean, very shady diagram here. Uh, the lighter gray is pretty much predominantly Muslim North and the darker gray is predominantly Christian South. Of course, there is a small minority of people who are agnostic atheists or traditional practice worshippers. Um, and then of course, Nigeria is very big on agriculture. We produce cocoa, rubber, oil palm, cotton, cashew nuts, and we have a wide range of resources from limestone to coal to cement, iron ore, name it. Historically, before uh, we were colonized by the British, we had um, distinct politics and, and polities from the Oyo Empire, the Benin Empire, the Sokoto Caliphate, the Bornu Empire. These were, I mean, Nigeria was just a range of diverse groups of people who spoke differently, lived differently, looked differently, um, and practiced differently. But as we know in history from the Berlin Conference, Nigeria was decided uh, and the British ruled um, from 1861. Um, we derived our name from the various, I mean, the famous Niger River. That's where Nigeria comes from. It was coined by a British journalist, Flora Shaw, and she called Nigeria Niger area. So, I mean, it became Nigeria. 
Um, interestingly, the word Niger is the Latin word for black. So I'm sure you can relate to where some of that language sort of came from. In 1960, after over eight decades of colonial rule, we gained independence in 1960 with the gentleman here, Sir Bubakar Tafawabali, who was our first prime minister, um, whom was later assassinated in 1966 after a coup and a series of events which culminated into uh, the Biafran War from 1967 to 1970. Um, I'll speak more about the Biafran War if there's interest in that, but just to give you a background around our journey from pre-colonial, colonial, and then, and then post-colonial. Today, Nigeria claims the status of being the giant of Africa. We are the biggest economy on the continent. We um, have the largest population and we have such a robust and emerging market. Two key areas, entertainment, um, music and movies. As you can see, we've copied the Hollywood typology of, uh, of our movie industry. Um, we are the second largest film industry in the world with an annual output of nearly 2,500 films. And uh, the industry is worth 6.5 billion US dollars. Um, in terms of music, our total revenue in the music segment is up to 4.7 million US dollars. And we have the second best performing entertainment consumer market globally. So music and entertainment are two things Nigerians are known for globally. Nigeria and the US have had really rich and robust relationship. And I'm just gonna go through a very abridged timeline from 1960 when we gained independence to today. So in 1960, we joined the um, non-allied force in terms of countries that did not want to be a part of any of the blocs. Um, and in 1967 to 1970, uh, the U.S. refused, uh, you know, the, Niger the, the U.S. actually supported sort of the, the cessationist uh, group within Nigeria uh, by sympathizing with the human rights uh, sufferings, you know, of these people in, in, in the eastern part of Nigeria. The timeline moves down to 1978 when we first had a, uh, the first ever time a U.S. president would visit a uh, Black African country. That was in 1978 by Jimmy Carter. That's a very big deal in Nigeria's history. In, in 1993, uh, the U.S. rebooked uh, you know, the coup, especially because of the amount of debts and human rights violations that emanated from that. In 2003, the Nigerian government received 109 million um, in foreign assistance from the U.S., which is a huge climb from 7 million in pre-democracy from 1998. Um, we all know what the Leahy law is from 2014, where Senator Leahy proposed that uh, the U.S. would not support governments where their human rights records were very, um, were very terrible. In 2020, we were on the controversial Trump ban list. And today, with the Biden administration, which has greenlighted $1 billion worth of arms sales in Nigeria, to fight our uh, insecurity issues. So what's going on right now, what's happening right now in Nigeria is we are less than one month away from our presidential election. So we're going to decide who the next president of Nigeria is going to be. And in all of Nigeria's history, um, there's been a lot of uncertainty. You know, in the past, we've always had certainties in terms of who might likely be you know, the president, but this time around, um, we face a very serious threat to the point that Sahara reporters actually say that it would not be awkward if the results get canceled uh, or postponed in some sort. But let me give you a little background to the elections that are coming up in less than 30 days. Um, when the current president got into office, he got a 70% approval rating, but it has plummeted as low as 27% uh, from last year. And this is because there's been an unpopular uh, support within the youth community with a seven months Twitter ban, as well as a massacre of young people um, in Lagos, which was quite, was, was a big breaking news. I did write uh, an article about this on the World Economic Forum about how uh, the end, the Lekki massacre, the massacre of young people who were asking the government for a better life was actually simultaneous to the Black Lives Matter movement in the US. So currently we have four in 10 Nigerians living below the poverty line and Nigeria still ranks quite high on the global terrorism index. So next month, by the 27th, hopefully of February, one of these three individuals will emanate as the uh, next president of Nigeria. Just a brief profile about who they are. Uh, Peter Obi was former governor. He enjoys considerable clout on social media with a lot of people supporting him within the young demography. Um, with his position for frugal management of resources and youth empowerment. 
This is another candidate, Bola Tinubu, who seems to be highly respected as well as a godfather figure in Nigerian politics, former governor of Lagos State. Lagos State is the commercial capital of Nigeria. And he, he's going along with the famous saying of this is my turn, reflecting his destiny and the promise that was given to him to lead Nigeria by, by, by some political elites. This is the third candidate who is following Biden. He has actually said he's following uh, President Biden's trajectory of serving as former vice president. And then he wants to serve as, you know, as president as well. He's run for office six times in the last 30 years. So the hot topic right now in Nigeria is all about the elections. Interestingly, for the first time ever in Nigeria, 52% of the polls are undecided. Nigerians are still not, um, have not decided who they would vote. Of course, the other, uh, the other candidates sort of sheer uh, popularity within the Nigerian population. For the first time, I mean, Nigeria's internet penetration is at 37%, which is the highest it has ever been since our country's history. Uh, there's a lot of the proliferation of like new media tools and social media has engaged a lot of internet active users. So we are currently at 99 million who are connected to the internet. That is not as many as those who are not connected to the internet, but there's a high range or high use of like WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, TikTok, and uh, a couple of other websites. So it's interesting that the elections next month is going to be consequential because we are also going to be conducting uh, a census for the first time since 2006. The challenges remain corruption, insecurity, ethnic nationalism, religious bigotry, and poverty. These are the really key issues that you know, we're dealing with. Another issue regarding what we're dealing with today in Nigeria is the issue of increasing insecurity. Um, Nigeria faced a lot in terms of insecurity concerns from kidnappings, um, which a couple of months ago, the U.S. Embassy had to airlift a couple of its staff out of, uh, out of Nigeria to the U.S. due to some of these security concerns. And that led to a couple of airlines canceling flights, um, uh, but things got back to normal. But aside the, the like, physical or the threats of, of various multiple groups, 25 million are at risk of, inf of, of food insecurity in, in this year. I mean, this was a news released by the UNICEF two days ago. The UNICEF earlier said it was 70 million Nigerians at risk of food insecurity. They apologized and said, nope, it's actually 25 million Nigerians. That's about two days ago. So when we're talking about insecurity, this is driven by poverty, religious extremism, by corruption, and, and a couple of all that. I have a few facts here about you know, the the economic, in quote, value of, of kidnapping, which is, seems to be a current trend in the last uh, few months. Over 3,400 people have been kidnapped in the past year. The rate of kidnapping has increased by 470% between 2015 and 2021. Um, so these are some of the insecurity-based issues and some of the fears Nigerians have as they move towards uh, the elections next month. Um, and because of all of these and more, uh, there's a big youth youth exodus where we call it the Jakba syndrome. <laughs> Jakba means to relocate, to travel abroad, to find better opportunities. From a poll conducted, 73% um, of Nigerians want to relocate out of the country if they've had the opportunity. Um, but within the medical or within the professional space, 88% of medical doctors in Nigeria are currently seeking for work opportunities um, abroad. And the US, um, US institutions are, are pitching for Nigeria's very high talent. Um, I, I'm aware that Nigerians constitutes the most educated immigrant community in the United States. So, um, you know, not only the US, but UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are pretty much looking at our youth demography with skill and competence. Um, so it's like uh, there's attraction on both sides. Well, a lot of young people want to move. Other countries too are like, oh, we're, we're going to get good talent from this unique country whose uh, median age is 17 years. So 71% of the Nigerian population are actually young people. Um, yes, Kelvin talked about my work in the use of artificial intelligence. I, that's the field that I work in from the legal side. And um, we have what we project as a new economy for Nigeria. Although Nigeria's oil still contributes over 90% of our country's GDP, the country is very, very particular about diversifying revenue as the, the oil is beginning to deplete. We have a lot of growing industries right now. Um, so uh, economically, we're, I mean, we're still a very poor country, but we are growing in terms of 
specific areas like transport and storage by 41%, finance by 12%, ICT by 10, entertainment by uh, by 7.8%. Like I said earlier, entertainment is really big on the African continent for Nigerians and across the world generally. Bloomberg released a statement that a Nigerian singer CK um, released the biggest hit in Africa's entire history. Um, and these, I mean, CK is a big celebrity, but he's not even one of the top five. We were talking about like big entertainers. Whiskey, on the other hand, in the picture below, has become the first African artist to surpass 5 billion streams in the global streaming platform, uh, Spotify. So music, entertainment, fashion, um, these is where, and technology, these are the areas that Nigeria seems to thrive the most in, in today's times. MIT conducted a study, um, and their projection is that it is possible that um, the music industry and entrepreneurship is going to be the new oil for Nigeria. Nollywood, a movie industry, uh, which um, provides more, which produces more films than Hollywood. Interestingly, no, most people don't know that. <laughs> it also employs over 300,000 people. Um, and we have the fashion sector accounting for 37% of our total e-commerce revenue. So Nigeria today is hugely uh, promising when it comes to technology, not just because I work in tech, but also because um, there's a lot that has that has happened within um, you know, the tech sector. We have over 238 tech startups and we've raised over two point, um, over more than 2 billion US dollars in the last seven years. In fact, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya and South Africa, the four countries that 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 take over ninety percent of the of the tech space on the entire African continent. The other fifty countries scrabble for the remaining about eight or nine percent. And Nigeria is the biggest, largest ICT market with eighty two percent of the continent's telecom subscribers and twenty nine percent of internet usage. So there is a projection for a non-oil solution, an alternative to oil. We've seen big celebrities like Jack Dorsey come all the way to Nigeria to visit and engage with, um, Jack Dorsey is the former, uh, former president or owner of Twitter, um, um, to see how they can sort of contribute and tap into this new oil in terms of the, you know, the promising nature of technology. Nigeria also has its National Center for AI and Robotics, which is under the Nigerian Information Technology Dep Development Agency, where I am working who where i'm working with or i'm working with them to develop nigeria's first ai policy and so um we have a huge population and we have a huge young population whom are very promising eager um, to learn to grow and build their skill in tech we also have a few challenges in terms of availability of software and hardware issues around human rights violations from police brutality the high cost of business due to power shortages and due to uh, the dollar naira exchange rates just keep, you know, disappointing us and more. So generally, um, that's what's been happening in Nigeria. I'll give you a little bit of a background historically, give you a bit about what is currently going on right now. The entire sentiment focused on the elections coming up in a couple of days. And I told you some of our challenges in terms of insecurities um, and the poverty profile of the country. But more importantly, are the prospects through music, entertainment and technology. This is a picture of my city, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. It's uh, the city gate when you're getting into the city. One thing you love Abuja for is uh, there's lots of green spaces. Um, still developing, but uh, we, you know, we're struggling. And so thank you so much for your audience. And uh, if you have any questions, please do let me know. I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much, Jake. Uh... Uh, for the very interesting background, introduction and background uh, about Nigeria. Uh, I know you, you mentioned that you're presently working with Nigeria to build its first or develop its first AI uh, policy. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that and then what that entails? Great. Um, so we always hear AI is the future and the rest of that. <laughs> of course, we need to deconstruct that idea. Um, but Nigeria is, is seeing the potential that the country has in terms of its tech sector, how um, it's been quite progressive in the last seven years. Nigeria is uh, optimistic in the ways that it can use artificial intelligence to build its economy, to build um, 
its production profile to also like see how we can solve some of the country's problems. Some, it's very aware that AI cannot solve many of our problems. Um, but I've been commissioned to, to, to lead a team of volunteers to develop Nigeria's first AI policy. And what we've done so far is we've, we've been able to narrow down on uh, uh, six key areas that Nigeria thinks AI would, would, would help the country. The first is on labor and productivity. The second is on security, as you've seen from my presentation. Third is on education and research. The fourth is on healthcare, which is very, very important for, you know, for Nigeria. Um, the fifth is on media and communications. And, um, and the sixth is on fintech, on finance. Uh, when it comes to AI, Nigeria seems to <laughs> do a lot with that in the, you know, in the fintech sector. So those are uh, the key areas, and we've been doing a lot of consulting. And uh, we hope that by hopefully after the elections, we would have the draft policy out. Wow, excellent, excellent. That sounds uh, really remarkable. Thank you for you know, all the work uh, you're doing in that, that area. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions that came through the chat here. Um, just on a more related topic, um, a question came through here about what, what Nigeria is doing in terms of green energy infrastructure and sustainability, sustainability practices. Okay. Yeah, then we do have a we have a, a ministry of well. Let me not talk as a government official. Let me talk from what I see in Nigeria as as a, as a citizen, right? Um, we have Nigeria is very aware that uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation is very critical because Nigeria will be one of the countries that would suffer uh, from the climate change impact. Um, so there is a huge government project to plant over twenty five million trees. Um, that's just one of the efforts. There's We've not done much in in terms of recycling because we don't have the. <laughs> there needs to be a complete re-education in terms of letting people know how to recycle. So that's where we're like we're, you know we're quite challenged um, with. But in terms of our sustainability plan, there's been a huge gamut of projects in terms of building trees, in terms of using more climate friendly and more climate um, um, adapting. Um, uh, both policies and practices across Nigeria, but we still we still have a huge problem with deforestation. We still have a huge problem with like fossil fuels and and a lot of like Niger So one of the things we get criticized for in Nigeria is the fact that the Nigerian government is still heavily promising in its use of coal. Uh, we have very huge coal deposits, and the and the government is of the view that what are we going to do with all this coal? Um, we need to use them to provide electricity. So we have a coal to power project that hopes to provide like tons of like megawatts that Nigerians can use. And they've been conversations about how to ensure that like the coal to power process is more sustainable, more environmentally friendly. And uh, so Nigeria is big on that, but of course we, there's still a lot of criticism around why even, why are you even using coal now? Um, it's again, Nigeria might be rich on the, in terms of the African profile, but it's still one of the, it was the poverty capital of the world as at three, three years ago before India took over and who knows, Nigeria might still take over again. So we are not, we don't have a phenomenal record in terms of climate change. Um, where on, on some levels we're doing really well on, on other levels, we're not doing as well. Um, we do have a couple of government policies that have, um, started talking about, reducing carbon emissions for like state trips, government officials. Um, we also have a couple of sustainable buildings or sustainable projects um, that we're that 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 the government is looking at. One interesting thing that came up this year was Nigeria is doing something to preserve um, animals that are only that can only be found in certain parts of Nigeria and certain plants that are already going extinct. So in the Niger Delta region, um, there are certain um like insects or plants or animals that they are at risk of extinction and the government have like developed policies to see how they can protect those so there's just a few examples here and there but i i, I would give it a, a a b b plus or b b <laughs> in terms of our climate record excellent excellent thank you very much for that uh jake um just kind of uh, uh shifting gears a little bit here you you spoke about the nsars movement uh, you said you actually wrote uh, uh, on that movement or wrote about the movement. Uh, there's a question here that I think there's a need here to maybe talk about uh, the movement against police brutality and how that is affecting politics in Nigeria. 
um, the, the person who typed this question said they've heard of the phrase Sorosoke. Sorosoke. And how that has uh, influenced the movement. <laughs> Sarasuke means to speak up. I think it's a Yoruba adage, right? So the article I wrote was, it was called Why Nigeria's Ensar Movement is More Than a Call to End Police Brutality. And I start by explaining that um, it's, a, it's a broader call for social justice from the Nigerian youth. Um, and it was really big. In fact, it was the biggest trending issue. In fact, on Twitter, it was more resounding than the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement. That was how critical it was. We had celebrities like Rihanna, um, Kanye West and a couple of other people who chimed in to this incident. Um, but in my article, I first of all explained that Nigerians are a part of a generation who have been through two global recessions in their formative years. So at the COVID-19 pandemic, Nigerians had to experience um, a situation where they were asking the government for accountability, asking the government to, to actually remove a department of the police force in Nigeria that was it was it was called the special anti robbery squad, but they really were just targeting young people, and they did a lot of damage in terms of killings, uh, forced disappearances of young people, and people were like tired of it. Young people were like, we don't want to have this uh, branch of the police force anymore. Of course, the government responded to that by disbanding this segment of the police force. Again, there's a lot of literature around how this is very similar to the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. at the time. But more importantly, other things I highlight is how you know young Nigerians are willing to have frank conversations about disability rights, about LGBT rights, about tribalism and religious bigotry in the country. So it was one movement to end police brutality, but it was an envelope to a lot of conversations when it comes to human rights, when it comes to anti-corruption um, um, and the rest of that. So the Sorosoke movement was about empowering young people to speak up, to take charge and take over. Um, it did have a very serious impact and still does have an impact in terms of who would become the next president because Nigerians felt very disappointed by the fact that um, uh, military men opened fire at protesters right there in Lagos. Wow. Really incredible. 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 I know uh, several of us heard a lot about that movement and we're able to you know, tap in or provide support, right? And, and it was really driven by social media, like uh, celebrities who turned on their Instagram live right there at the scene. And that was where evidence was gotten to prove that armed officials um, opened fire on young, hapless, like, protesters. Uh, the government did set up a special unit to investigate all of this. Compensation has been given to a couple of people, but some of the people are still missing. People are still experiencing threats because they spoke up against uh, such a human rights violation. And CNN did a great job in unraveling this because initially there was no evidence. The government was like, no, nobody was killed. But thanks to social media, people had their phones and they recorded and they investigated where the bullets came from. There was a huge um, documentary done on this. So a lot of Nigerian, young Nigerians are still hurt by the fact that when they came out to, to see how they can make the country better at the time of COVID-19 pandemic, they were responded with like bullet shots. I mean, on, on the same, uh, I'd say, topic of young Nigerians and uh, how uh, I suppose there's been this increase in uh, the voicing of frustration, right, with how the system is set up and the mass exodus uh, that we're noticing. Uh, someone had a question around that. Uh, the person said it was an anonymous question here. They said that they read a book and the IRC book club recently, I believe it was Chimamanda's book, Americana. Uh, the book chronicled, uh, the, I think it was the story of a young Nigerian woman who moved to America for university as part of the Jackba movement you mentioned earlier, so the mass exodus, um, but uh, that they end, ended up moving back to Nigeria. And this person wants to know, do you think that this trend would be reversed at some point to where we are seeing uh, these amount of large amount of Nigerian youths who left Nigeria at some point uh, return many years later. Very important question, I must say. I think Chimamanda needs to write a part two of Americana because when she wrote that book, we, were, we didn't experience the level of youth exodus or the, the level of migration that we're seeing today. Um, even though I must point out how difficult it is for Nigerians to move, it's an expensive venture. Um, for example, in, in Nigeria, 
to get a US to, to get an appointment for a US visa, the dates are taking up to 2025. So it's really tough just to get an appointment, not whether you're going to be given. Um, so it's really, really tough. Not only do Nigerians leave their sources of livelihood, they actually leave everything and go to other countries to start from the very scratch. Not to mention how expensive flight tickets are, how the visa options are not very automatic. A lot of people get rejected, name it, even when they've got like valid admission to uh, like Ivy League schools. But in terms of whether I see people going back, I think one thing has been very clear with history. Nigerians abroad, Nigerians in diaspora, contribute um, over 17.2 billion US dollars in remittances. So 17.2 as at 2021, 17.6 billion as at 2022 as of last year. So Nigerians are somehow obligated and they support the system. If those diaspora remittances are not going back, I don't know how the country would sustain itself. So a lot of Nigerians are working four, five, six jobs abroad to be able to send monies back home. They're sustaining the other members who could not, Jackba, who could not leave. Um, so there is that connection. Nigerians are in, interested in what's going on. Nigerians are looking forward to participate, even though they're not on ground. Yes, I figure like with Ghana, you find that some people actually moved back to Ghana. Some like Ghanaians in, in the US moved back to Ghana in the last three, four years. Like, okay, let me go back. The country seems to be better. Um, Ghana has like over like a 10 years difference when it comes to life expectancy compared to Nigeria. So they're doing slightly better in that regard. I think in the future, if things do get better, um, we will have more Nigerians go back. The last thing I would say is there's been a lot of Americans, a lot of Nigerian Americans who have returned to Nigeria, but those are a privileged few. And mostly they are people who work in tech um, because tech is very promising, you know, for Nigeria and the African continent. So that ex that relocation going back from the West back to the African continent is premised on opportunity and privilege. Yes, I know we, we've, uh, there seems to be, despite, you know, all the challenges, there seems to be a lot of opportunity uh, within Nigeria, uh, within the country, especially as far as the, uh, where the youth are concerned. Absolutely. Um, yes, uh, it, talking about just uh, issues of like, perhaps challenges facing Nigeria, what might you say would be the major or top challenge facing the country at this time? I think it has to do with, um, you know, there's a huge disparity between the haves and the haves not, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about a country with a 33% unemployment rate, 33% unemployment rate, four in 10 leave at the poverty line. So that's the foundation for why insecurity is rife. That's the reason why people are doing things like kidnapping um, and all the rest. Like you come to Nigeria, you find that labor is extremely cheap. People are willing to work for like 10 times less the pay, right? Even as a lawyer myself, Nigeria still operates the principle of employment where it's employers can hire and fire at their discretion because there's huge amount. In fact, so many people to be employed. If you don't deliver 100%, there's seven people outside the door waiting to take your position for 70% less to pay. So... Um, the poverty is really is is really striking, and so there's that desperation, um, there's that competition, and I think that poverty, the level of poverty we're experiencing now, is the major reason for all the frustration, is the major reason for the insecurity, for the corruption, and more. And because the the more people are are poor, the rich are also trying to buffer. They're like, oh, they 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 are seeing the effects of what poverty can you know can create. So they're accumulating more and shielding and protecting their own, their kids, and you know, insulating themselves with a lot more wealth. And this is where I think uh, the major problem is right now. I mean, uh, uh, certainly, I would uh, I, I I would have to agree with you on that, uh, Jake, because as uh, someone who uh, is from Nigeria and visits Nigeria. Uh, quite often for pro bono work, I've had the uh, uh, perhaps unfortunate opportunity, right, to live very closely to some of those challenges. And I've seen firsthand uh, what that disparity uh, really looks like on the front lines. Right. Um, uh, thinking about a, a potential solution to this, uh, what are maybe your personal thoughts as to what a solution might be to this major challenge or what thoughts are out there uh, as far as uh, solutions are concerned? 
I think one thing that I'm grateful for is the phenomenon of globalization. Like a lot of young Nigerians who work in tech can live in Nigeria and work for Google, Twitter, Meta, um, and provide real value. So um, even with like medical doctors in Nigeria who deal with clients abroad through telemedicine, right? So the opportunities for technology and for globalization has opened up for a lot of Nigerians, but it hasn't opened up for the people who are not connected to the fourth industrial revolution economy, people who don't know how to use the internet, people who provide menial jobs. Um, so I think in terms of a solution, it's, I am very pro empowering young people. And a lot of that is taking place. Like, you know, a little water, a little borehole project in a local community can go a huge way in providing that community with like sustainable water, right? Um, a three month technology course for young girls in boarding school has helped like 25 girls learn how to code. And they went for competitions internationally and beat some Chinese counterparts. So it's, it just speaks to the Nigerian dream, the Nigerian passion that these young girls in a very local village who struggle with electricity and use lantern at night can learn how to code from a three months project and fly abroad for a competition and beat people who always have you know hardware and software tools to use. Um, so I think the future is bright, um, but it's latched on the opportunities that technology would bring, the opportunities that young people can participate in. I would say this is my personal opinion, young people don't have a stake in the elections they look at the people that are running for office look at the people who hold key positions in nigeria they're they're hardly young they are hardly very educated if we're going to add that as well so sometimes the more educated the more energetic you are the more you're a threat to the superstructure so young people are creating an alternative it's not like all these artists want to sing nigeria has a good big talent of people who can sing but you know people want to learn how to produce music learn how to code learn how to design clothes things they can do with their hands so they can sustain themselves and their families. So that's the alternative. The goal is in the future for the alternative to be the main. When the new oil through tech, through creativity, through entrepreneurship becomes more relevant, when the oil dries up, maybe we will see that complete shift. Wow. That's uh, very, very insightful, Jake. And, and you mentioned something that I thought was really interesting there, that the young people do not have a stake in this upcoming election. Uh, what, what might the reason for that be? Are there, you know, power brokers or uh, there's a question here wanting to know if they're power brokers or like the army or rich oligarchs who influence the election or, you know, uh, have a huge impact and say in terms of the outcome of the election, might that be more part of the reasons? Yes, I uh, just saw Shahid's question. Very, very important question. Yes, we do have brokers. And they have, in fact, let me say the broker community when it comes to elections and politics in Nigeria is expanding. So we have former presidents. For example, the president who received Jimmy Carter, Odisha Gobasanjo, has served through the military, served as president twice. Um, his position, his opinion as to who Nigerians should vote carries a lot of weight. He's a broker. So you find him, he was able to go to Ethiopia, for example, to resolve some of the political and uh, some tensions in Ethiopia. Um, so he he holds these meetings with political parties, holds these meetings with contestants. He goes, okay, he's able to broker a deal as a sort of father figure. There are other people like that who, because of their money, because of their wealth, um, because of their previous political position and affiliations, I will call them power brokers. And they're doing a really strategic job right now. A new set of brokers have emerged, and thanks to technology, there is a report by, by the BBC that showed social media influencers being paid up to 20 million naira to tweet to young people their favorite political candidates. So you have people who build empires, who are millionaires, not only in Naira, but in USD, because they're social media influencers. They've got huge following on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the rest, um, especially Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. These people are the new set of brokers. And so they are mostly young and they are mostly educated. Of course, a couple of them are swindled by wealth. So they're not really pushing candidates that they think would be best for the country. They are pushing candidates that have paid them. Uh, but some of them are doing like a middle-based approach. Yes, they take money from these guys, but then they also... So like I said, the broker community, the power broker community is expanding. 
and it plays a significant role in our forthcoming elections. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, what about what about the West? So uh, countries like the United States and countries like the United Kingdom, who uh, uh, of which Nigeria is a former uh, uh, British colony, what role do they play today, right, in Nigeria? I mean, Nigeria is a former British colony, but the U.S. seems, in my opinion, has a much more stronghold um, on Nigeria than than the U.K. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can look at the history like I, I, I outlined um, when the U.S. sneezes, the, like the world catches cold, as they say. Um, the U.S. has played a significant role um, since 1999 in Nigeria. In terms of the political space, one thing the U.S. has tried and succeeded in doing is to ensure that human rights are protected and lives are not lost during like heightened times of elections. So we've seen the U.S. threaten certain key politicians whom have amassed like weapons that could kill the lives of many people. We've seen the U.S. threaten them with like visa bans, which seems to be quite a, 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 a big force. When you threaten a politician, but like we're not going to give you a U.S. visa, they seem to act up or, you know, behave much better than explain to them why the value of human life is important, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you sort of threaten them, you're not going to go to the US, you're not going to go to California. <laughs> they seem to, they seem to sit up. So the US, I'm just giving one example, but the US plays a very big role through the US AID, for example, in supporting like grassroots movement. In fact, there are communities in Nigeria whose livelihoods, access to like medication, it only comes from like grants from the US AID. So aside um, the US playing a nonpartisan role, it does a job of acting as a, a mediator sort of to ensure that, you know, hey, human rights are important, um, you know, and even when issues like the NSAS or the Lekki massacre takes place or where like, you know, certain things go on in certain northern parts of the country in terms of insecurity, the, the US government would speak up, would condemn some of these things. And I think those things play a very significant role. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's very, very helpful to know. Are, are there, I'm just thinking, are there any concerns amongst, uh, perhaps it's widespread, perhaps it's uh, minority opinion amongst certain groups in Nigeria about uh, such a, a foreign, power for an entity like the United States having such a stronghold or influence on the country or sovereign, another sovereign country? No, I actually think more people are feeling like the U.S. needs to do more. Yeah. I feel like the U.S. does not want to, like they always try to be like, well, look, we're an independent sovereign nation. We will engage based on diplomatic ties, but that's it, right? The U.S. is more like... I think more people are like, you should do more. For example, during the NSAS protest, a lot of young people were like asking the US embassy, like, you know, the US embassy provided support for activists and, you know, to ensure that they were protected and the rest. But um, I think there's more, the question is for the US to do more. Of course, it's unfair to demand an independent country to do to inter in, interfere in your own, like uh, in your own country's uh, like issues. Um, but, I think the U.S. also recognizes that there are other countries as well at play. There's China, there's like Russia. These are countries that are gaining quite so much, so much leverage in Nigeria, Japan, you know, Germany. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, Nigeria seems to be a hot spot for bilateral and diplomatic work. Um, but kudos to the U.S. government for, um, first of all, unraveling some of the issues with Boko Haram at the moment. So I remember very well in 2005, John Campbell was the minister, was the US, um, the US ambassador to Nigeria. And he was the one who actually helped the Nigerian government to tell them, look, this is the projection of what this small group called Boko Haram could look like if you don't do X, Y, Z. And everything he laid out came to pass. Um, so providing information, sometimes the US government does that. Like before it lifted some of its um, staff out of the country to inform the Nigerian government, hey, look, these are some of the areas that you need to look at. But more importantly, binding support by providing arms um, to, you know, to fight insecurity. Those are ways that are, I'm guessing the government is doing their best. Um, so where young people don't see hope from their government, they hope on other countries to, to intervene. I'm not blinded by the fact that that could, there are some like diplomatic 
issues with that um but i mean we could we could talk about that in a different conversation right. especially right. as the us is not the only foreign government you know in nigeria there are others as well and there's a competition in that regard that's right i think that's a perfect segue in uh, to uh, uh, for Lasonia Thompson's question. Uh, Lasonia said that they visited Nigeria, they visited Abuja in 2021 and saw several incomplete construction projects in <laughs> Abuja and asked what the future of Chinese relations are. I mean, can, can we first talk about what that means, having these incomplete construction projects, <laughs> how the Chinese come into play here? Right. There are so many, I mean, we could unpack those questions in, so, so there are so many incomplete construction projects. Some of them are because fundings for them were cut short. Some of them are because um, it's just corruption. You know, someone was granted the, you know, the project and they did it halfway. For example, we have a beautiful national library that once it comes to fruition, it would be the best national library, the best library in Africa, but they've been building it for like, I don't know, 12, 15 years, because government after government, you know. Um, so, but I would tell you that there are a lot of completed construction projects. Nigeria is hugely developing. So the amount of development that goes on in Nigeria is huge. Yes, I can talk a little bit about, I can talk a lot about the insecurity issues, but the country is hugely developing in terms of population size, in terms of development projects, in terms of housing projects. Um, hugely. Um, so you come back again and come, come, I'll take you to where you find completed construction projects. Now to your second question about the future of Chinese relations, it is increasing in Nigeria. Nigeria has taken a lot of loans from the Chinese, as well as so many other African countries, Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Um, some of these loan agreements, uh, perhaps not very friendly. <laughs> They're quite lopsided. There's an inequality of bargaining power. There's some level of undue influence, but Nigeria is sustaining its country with those loans. Um, if you look at our current budget of how many trillion, part of it is expected money from the Chinese. So of course the Chinese are very interested in Nigeria and they've, they've engaged in certain projects. They were the ones who built, I think the railway from the airport to Kaduna, they're the ones who renovated the airport. Um, so the reason why the airport took quite a long time before it was completed, it was very, it was in construction for a long time. I'm sure maybe you, you noticed that. It's because it was a project done by the Chinese, so Nigerians can't hasten it except you know they complete that you know in that regard. So the the there's a huge the same way people are going to the US or the UK. There are Nigerians who are also traveling to China. Um, there's even currently a proposal for a direct flight from Nigeria to is it Shanghai or Beijing? Um, I think from one of the commercial centers, I don't know if it's Ovary or Onicha, I don't know, there is a, a plan for a direct flight to go from Eastern Nigeria to China because a lot of commercial uh, manufacturing productivity happens along those lines. So you find that the Chinese relation is increasing in terms of government loan and funding, in terms of um, bilateral relations, in terms of people engaging in terms of businesses, buying and selling, but not much, well, maybe a lot more, but not as much in terms of cultural sharing. Um, yeah, in one way, I think whilst there are lots of Nigerians who now learn Mandarin, who now travel to China, um, I don't know of like Chinese who learn, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't think there's much around the cultural side compared to how you say US um, African relations where you have Davido who's an American Nigerian, you have Zain Asha who's on CNN, who's an American Nigerian. Like you can see a lot of American Nigerian relationships. Uh, so it, there's a lot politically, economically that we can talk about when it comes to the Chinese relations. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, I, I know we, you, you made mention earlier, and of course, in the stats, you, you showed us um, the oil and gas sector is uh, where Nigeria gets is, is a major source of revenue for the country. Um, are there efforts or can you speak to any efforts by the Nigerian government to utilize revenue generated from oil and gas to develop you know other sectors uh, to uh, you know pump that into infrastructural development and improving the standard of living I think this was a question for by uh, Shaheed yeah wouldn't that be great <laughs> um, yes I think most if not all of the, the revenue that uh, 
we generate from oil and gas is what actually sustains the entire country, right? Um, historically, one of the reasons why the eastern part of the country was trying to seed from Nigeria and the reason why the other parts fought them was because the Niger Delta region is the major producer of oil and gas. So, you know, that's where the oil and gas comes from mostly. Um, so there is, I mean, there are projects that have been funded from monies gotten from oil and gas, but there's a lot of corruption as well that we're dealing with within the oil and gas sector. Um, there's a lot of lack of accountability. So you find that, you know, we we, we don't do a great, we, we, we try, but we don't, based on the amount of revenue that we generate, based on the amount of deposits of oil and gas and all these natural resources that we have, we should not be the way we are developmentally. We should have advanced way much more. We should have free healthcare for everyone. We should have way much more than free universal education, but up to, like we have that resources. We have some of these resources, but to translate them into certain sectors that would work is still a big challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we still have a, a little bit more time, but uh, uh, one question I, I really want to ask, uh, and I'm sure given your background and uh, your area of expertise with uh, artificial intelligence, where I, I would like to know, where do you see Nigeria you know, in the next decade? <laughs> That's so most times that people predict what would happen in the next years, they are always based on conjecture. And most times they don't really because we don't we didn't we didn't predict COVID and COVID just disrupted everything, right? So we don't know um, you know, what's gonna happen in the next few years. But one thing I would say is, and I think someone asked a question about what's the major challenge for the tech sector. Nigeria is going through the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions at the same time. And I think this poses a unique dilemma because you go to certain parts of the country, they have never seen electricity before. Like a mobile phone would be like, wow, what is this? Um, having electricity in that local community would be the best thing you would ever give them. In the same country, you have young kids who are developing robotic soft like hardware they are using ai systems machine learning algorithms so we're in a mix we have the poorest the richest the smartest the, we ha it's a, it's a, the, the diversity i would even call it diversity there's a binaries or what polarized in terms of where to go so it's difficult to predict that oh this country is going to do so well by using ai systems or by using artificial intelligence yes we have a lot of capacity being built in terms of ai but we still deal, I think the major thing we're dealing with is we still have issues around hardware, electricity, computers, you know, internet access that is fast and reliable, data, issues of like storing data, use it like there's a lot of those preliminary issues that we shouldn't be dealing with, but those are very fundamental. So I'm, I'm very impressed when I see young Nigerians who can code and they've developed AI systems. A young chap who's less than 15 years old developed a robot system that could help in the healthcare settings by providing medical, like super high-tech stuff. But in the same country, you have people who have never had access to pipe-borne, clear drinking water. Um, healthcare is still a huge challenge. Um, in the city that I live, Abuja, more than half of its residents get their healthcare from pharmacists, like chemists. So they go to like a, a kiosk, a shop, and they're like, oh, I have a headache. Oh, here, here you go. No prescription, no diagnosis, because they can't afford it, right? And this is the capital of the country. So when you move to other regions, then you begin to see the diversity in that regard. I've lived across all 36 states of my country, and you see how diverse the U.S. is in its 50 states. We have our own version. Um, you go to certain places, you ask yourself, am I, did I go to, a, am I, did I, they transport me to a different planet? You go to certain places, you'll be amazed by, you know, how green and healthy and the clarity of air, the life expectancy of those people. You move just like 10 kilometers next. It's a desert of just nothing works, nothing, you know, no production, people's life expectancy less than, less than 50 years. And what, what, what role, just uh, perhaps a final question here in the interest of time, what role do you see the youth play right, in Nigeria's development and uplifting the country. I know you've mentioned, made mention of the youth being, the, yeah. right, the largest, right, set uh, in terms of population in the country. 
uh, what role do you think that the youth will play in changing the trajectory of the country? I am optimistic, you know, since I was a kid, I've been hearing the youth of the future, the youth of the future. Um, but the current president of Nigeria was, I think, the military president when I was born. <laughs> And I'm in my 30s and he's president now. So I don't know if if we're just like talking about utopia or if really there is a pathway for young people to break the cycle and get into government and make, make way for themselves. I feel like a lot of young Nigerians just need opportunity. Um, they need opportunity. They have every, they need that opportunity and they would prove themselves well. But I must recognize that in a country as competitive as Nigeria, um, there's there's a lot that so many young people are dealing with. They're like mental health issues that we don't prioritize as much. Um, you know, for a country with 221 million people, we have a huge number of people living with disabilities who don't really get considered because the, I mean they're looking for the best. So where, why, how, why do we have to create a system for you or for this minority group? So they're like a lot of. Um, and we are learning as young people who are connected to the internet. We are learning from movies that the rights of LGBTQ people matter just as much as non-LGBTQ people as well. We are seeing value in that. We're having those difficult conversations. What does it mean for us to remove the subsidy of fuel? Yes, it would be hard, but that's one way to tackle corruption in Nigeria. So young people are having that conversation or these conversations. We just don't have the tools. We don't have the... We need, I don't know if you say we need allies who are like the big oligarchs or the, or the brokers. We need those allies to empower us. And I think those allies can come from anywhere, um, whether within Nigeria or outside Nigeria. So I believe the youth are the future, as we say. I believe the youth are the future. Um, but I don't want to be optimistic without reality. Nigerian youth are going through a lot, like a lot. And I don't know if the if in my lifetime I will experience that you know, voila, where young people are all represented in government and, you know, we have more women representation in, in like, look at, we have, we barely have up to 3% of women in, in government. We barely, we don't have up to 3% of women. Um, so, well, I mean, as a human rights lawyer, people say, how come, people, when people ask me, what field of human rights law do you do? I'm like, name it, I've done it all. You can't pick and choose in Nigeria. Children's rights are an issue. Women's rights are an issue. LGBT rights is an issue. Disability rights is an issue. Employment rights. Yeah, less hands, more issues. But I'm hugely optimistic and I'm proud of Nigeria, young Nigerians who are not giving up, who are fighting. Of course, some of them are running for offices. In fact, I'm, I have a few friends who are running for office now. Of course, some of them are not winning, but you know, I'm gunning for them. I'm rooting for them. I'm going to the polls. I'm going to vote for them. If one or two of them succeed, yes, that would inspire other young people to go ahead. But aside holding political positions, we also want to see young people thrive in academics, in um, technology in agriculture, you know, we want to see young people go back to the farms and farm and develop and write books, you know, and these things are happening, but we want them to happen faster and more. And I think that's where my, my hope is in. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. I think uh, ultimately uh, there's uh, a very hopeful outlook there, especially as far as the young persons are concerned in Nigeria. Uh, thank you again so much, Jake, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I uh, really, really, really appreciate the insightful discussion. I want to thank everyone who sent uh, questions in. And now I'll hand it back to Evan. Yes, I'd like to echo Kelvin. Thank you so much, uh, Jake, for the time you took today. And Kelvin, thank you so much for your wonderful moderation and for everyone who joined us today for our What's Happening series. Um, we This is a really meaningful and fruitful conversation, and we, we really appreciate everyone's involvement. So. Um, please visit our website at irckc.org uh, to learn more about the work of the IRC, uh, as well as other upcoming programs and uh, potentially how to join as a member if you're interested. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, please have a wonderful rest of your day. And Kelvin and Jake, uh, thank you again for your, your time and efforts today. It, it means a lot. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Thanks.